Hello, welcome to a special edition of Scuttlebutt. Russia has invaded Ukraine, and we are going to get on that as much as we can. I'm here with Vic and Will. Hello. Howdy. And um, we're just going to jump right into it, guys. Uh, yeah, Russia. I guess I want to caveat. I think I think uh, while we were warming up for this, um, William, you said you had a really good thing. Maybe why don't you just yeah, say it? Yeah, so – uh, I'm just going to clarify where we're coming from or, or getting our sources from. I think that's a very important thing to do, uh, not only as a historian, but just as a general, like, releasing information to the public. So uh, most of the sources we're doing or we're using are Western media um, with some uh, uh, examples like from, from Ukrainians on Twitter and Reddit and such. So keep in mind this is an era of misinformation, uh, electronic warfare, and propaganda so take everything we say uh into account that those are the sources we're using and please uh keep updated and go yeah. along and diversify your portfolio so to speak when looking at this conflict yeah absolutely i mean yeah totally understand that um and for those who've been um reading gazette articles or who are in the know like this is gray zone stuff Big time. And so what we mean by we're talking cyber warfare, we're talking information operations, um, we're talking about operations in the information environment. Um, so, yeah, you're going to have to – if you want to get smart on this thing, you're going to have to really dig in because if you're just taking your stuff from a single source, whether um, it's a major news source or um, an independent, um, you're, you're probably – only going to be getting a very small slice of what's actually happening with, with a, probably a very biased um, outlook on this. And then at the same time, understand that no matter where you're getting it from, the high propensity is it's coming from the UK, a Ukrainian perspective because that's who we have access to. Mm -hmm. um, that's where all our numbers are coming right. from. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of caveats here, but mm -hmm. I still think it's very, very worth – diving into and it's extremely so just to give a little context i spent my entire time in academia and uh even in the marine corps focusing on the middle east and east asia so we're talking about the baltics and we're talking about eastern europe i'm going to be doing a lot of deferring to nick and william on this um because i'm so i will be the i'll be the dumb guy in the room as always but officially <laughs> <laughs> like an unofficial motto. Uh, I'm the dumb guy in the room, so I'm going to probably ask a lot of stupid questions. Um, but, yeah, I, we're just going to jump in and see what, what yeah. this takes yeah. us. And, uh, yeah, diversify your, your news feeds. But yeah. we're, uh, because it's moving so fast, yeah. uh, we can't even hope to try and keep up with what's going on in, in, uh, in theater. Yeah, so I guess let's just so say, like, we're recording on a Thursday. If you listen yeah. to this on Monday, th the shit might be over. Yeah. Or it's very different mm -hmm. than what it is today, and mm -hmm. we're going to concede that point Yeah, as but well. we are going yeah. to try and lay down the steps that are leading to the situation as much as possible so that um, for whatever source you're listening to, trying to keep up with the news, at least we can provide some context to the situation on the ground and why Russia is mm -hmm. doing what they're doing right. and why Ukraine reacts how they react. and. Europe's reacting how they and, react. And, and, and like every sort of like significant historical event uh, that's ever happened, uh, there is always more uh, intricate uh, details. But we're going to try to we're gonna, we're definitely going to be painting with uh, broad uh, strokes here. But uh, we're also going to advocate like various other sources you can use to educate yourself further. Like I, I recommend for all of our uh, listeners, dear listeners out there, to uh, you know maybe brush off some of those like World War Two uh, Eastern Front documentaries. Uh, Colonel Woodbridge here at the Gazette office recommended reading a book called Bloodlands by Timothy D. Snyder to get more context on the uh, Ukrainian Russo uh, relationship. So yeah. we're just really going to try to, yeah, I think establish a framework so that you, the listener, at least has an idea of what the so what is yeah. out of this whole thing. Um, because I think it's very easy, uh, especially for Marine Corps centered podcasts like we are. To be only focused on EABO and to be focused on um, the first island chain. Um, so, you know, what does it matter with the Russians are, you know, moving west? And so, anyways, uh, all right. I, I think it all does, obviously. So, And we are, obviously, we all are have big, slow American tongues. We're, gonna <laughs> we're not going to pronounce mm -hmm. all the words correctly, that sure. whatever we are trying to say something from the Slavic regions. Yeah, no disrespect so, if we mess it yeah. up. So let's start with uh, kind of the flashpoint, 
call it the uh, do we want to Tarantino this thing like get into it in like in media's <laughs> red yeah, and yeah, yeah. backwards so yeah. kind of okay. so we know why we're going to go backwards let's just kind of look at the eastern breakaway regions of Lutensk and Donetsk again right we're, we're yeah. American saying right, right, right. Slavic words uh, <laughs> that are written naturally in Cyrillic um uh, the Donbass region. Right, Donbass region, yeah, yeah. Okay, so a couple years ago, was it a couple years ago or was it just yeah, last 2015, year? Yeah, 2015, I think, was the official ceasefire, but mm -hmm. yeah. um, it hasn't obviously gone well. Oh, yeah, so that, <laughs> okay, if we're going to get even bigger picture. Yeah. So I was going to refer to the uh, article that Putin himself wrote about the uh, the genocide, yeah. if you want to call it that, yeah, and just in for Donbass. For our listener, there are quotes around air that. Air quotes, I'm yeah, air, air quoting air coding, genocide. Yeah. And the reason why he was calling it a genocide is because they were Ukrainizing, 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 Westernizing. The, let's the, call yeah, yeah, yeah Western. let's call it Westernizing uh, as much of the country as possible. And they were doing that by just making them change the road signs to be in Ukrainian, and uh, just trying to uh, say education should be done in Ukrainian, and uh, without attacking or lifting a single gun. Uh, Putin said that that is genocide, you're destroying the Russian culture, whatever, um, and just kind of equated that kind of cultural movement with the genocide. And that is hyperbole in its most extreme. Yeah. And, and p according to Putin, um, which I think it, it, uh, we should also bring into the Russian perspective, just so like not because we're advocating for it necessarily, but because it's – the, they're, it's, worth, they, it's worth knowing. They are yeah. driven by their perspective. So right. it, the mm -hmm. more we know it, the, the better we are. But like, re he had like reports of, um, you know, finding uh, mass uh, burial graves, um, and also part of his like you know uh, manifesto and in going into Ukraine, he he wants to uh, uh, quote unquote denazify the country, right, right. which is mm -hmm. um, a big a big I mean an issue over in Ukraine because their perception of what the Nazis were is a lot different from what we we americans would perceive or most europeans it's 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 in the sense where being that being ukrainian in world war ii meant at one point you'd have part of your family potentially siding with the nazis part of your family being murdered by the nazis all because also like you know a few decades previously your family is also being murdered by the soviets so there's a lot of um like a cycle of hate going around mm -hmm. on on who you trust yeah. and who you don't trust and I've also like seen reports on Twitter from people saying that like the the issue of of of, of current day Nazis is not only like a U is is on both sides of the spectrum that there are like you know Russian Nazis and Ukrainian Nazis in in, in that region influencing politics. And, and I guess to define terms, when they're talking Nazi, it's not the American view of a Nazi like hey some skinhead who wants white supremacy. Mm -hmm. It's it's fascism, essentially, yes. is what they're alluding to. Yeah, and it's and it's a perverted view of what the fascism actually was. And it's weird saying it's a perverted view of it because of such a perverted, perverted system view of the system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, is, this one, is this a two yeah. negatives make a positive? Yeah, like, I don't think yeah. so. No, no, no. no. Sure. But it's, it's sure. like a – yeah. It's so just using, using like uh, one example of, of one of these uh, – Organizations. There's what, what is called the Azov Battalion. Uh, Battalion, sorry, in um in uh, Ukraine. And they're essentially they are what you would call right wing extremists and neo Nazis. And they do definitely. I mean, looking at this trusty source of Wikipedia. Um, again, please do further research. But I think it covers a lot of good bases. I mean, pretty a lot of Nazi iconic I I icons imagery. Yeah. Uh, image and and definitely obviously I mean anti anti semitism is a huge issue mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. over in Eastern Europe as well, but yeah so so Putin's building up I guess like these sort of or, uh, paramilitary organizations in Ukraine and like saying like how great of a threat they are and and is trying to you know it's a sense of you see this in America with protesters so there's one bad actor out there the opposing media is going to jump on that and and amplify that so that's what. Yeah, we could potentially argue that what he, Putin's doing by saying he wants to quote unquote denazify right. yeah. Ukraine. But the true irony of it is, that, and if again, world according to Vic, it seems like the tactics that he's using in opposition to denazify the Ukraine are the exact same tactics the Nazis used to. Um, Establish their uh, supremacy in oh, Germany. Yeah. Going back right? to I mean, like, like taking an event, doing false flag stuff, burning down things, and blaming mm -hmm. it on the Jews, 
um, burning down stuff and then blaming it on the Russians. A very similar situation was yeah. like Sudetenland. I mean, there were ethnic Germans in there, and you could a lot of probably ethnic Germans during that time thought they were being oppressed by by the Czechs. And Germany is like, no, these are German people. This is our old historic territory. And these Western countries, Britain, France, America, we drew, we, we drew the lines inappropriately. We are here to sort of correct this. And that's the issue going back to like the, the, the post-Cold War peace when the Soviet Union fell. Like, There's a lot of m different ethnicities and groups of people with all these territories, and they necessarily didn't fall along the right side of the border that they wished to. Yeah, and that is a very apt uh, comparison. Cause that is very close. Like It's mm -hmm. almost one-to-one. -one. But... Um, so, but part of the breakaway state problem is that Russia had been actively manipulating the numbers for quite a while. Oh, absolutely. And um, kind of pro-Russianizing the Donbass region. And then... Um, or, or at least and then capitalizing yeah, on that. Yeah, capitalizing mm -hmm. it. En encouraging Ukrainians to get out, uh, moving Russians in, like mm -hmm. just this whole mm -hmm. big shift. And it's like, if you wanted to put it in any other place, it would be like... We took a bunch of uh, we took a bunch of buffalo citizens and moved them across Niagara Falls, and decided that nope, that part of Canada is American now. Like right. it's kind of right. And 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 I mean, and, and I hate to to start jumping back already, but I mean, all of this started when the pro-Russian president of Ukraine was voted out of office. Yes. And that's when – so – but you could even go back further, and it's like, well, as NATO started to expand into Poland, uh, Lithuania, there was already a, a sense of a hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. Then you lose you, – you have the your pro-Russian president gone, a pro-democracy, pro-Europe president come into play, and then you have the Donbass region. So, I mean, it's there's all of these, like – there's sort of like a um, like you're uh, what yeah. are they called? You're registering your fires. Like you're you're starting to range out now. Like stuff is getting closer, I guess. And, yeah. And in the, their view, it's a threat to yeah. sovereignty. And the rapid um, modernization of Ukraine too, right. going from pretty much farmers still using wooden tools to right. like an actual modern economy. And then um, NATO not conceding that they won't try to roll Ukraine at some point yeah. into... Mm -hmm. Well, and Russia point. is mad, too, because, you know, they have two satellite, you know, border states, former satellite states, uh, in Finland and Ukraine that mm. are both kind of, I don't know if you want to say being courted. I don't think NATO is courting Ukraine at the moment. But uh, just because, A, political reasons, also, B, Ukraine doesn't bring a lot to the table. Right. Um, but, you know, you got Finland also, who's a much more attractive target for NATO. Uh, and um, that is very close to some very important cities in Russia. And it's like, well, if they're going to pick a target, they're going to pick Ukraine. Right, the but both fruit. of them are not uh, – Russia doesn't want either of them joining NATO. Right. So – and then um, – but they're kind of in similar boats, just with a lot different money. Ukraine is much poorer than Finland. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. right. Like so. there's uh, – you know, I guess it's like uh, qui bono, right? Like who benefits? Like yeah. NATO's going to go after the one that yeah. it's an immediate that, like, yeah. return on your investment. But I'm not in the NATO meetings. I don't know who we're actually yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. Court, and, so. and, then <laughs> and then there's the EU, too, which is yeah. the same thing, too. So it's, mm -hmm. And this is, I guess, and again, history buff, please. Like, but this is so reminiscent of, like, what led up to World War One, right? Like, there's just yeah. so many organizations vying for power here. Exactly. So there's there's definitely, a, I think, like a, a power space going on. And I think, um, at least from what I've heard from a lot of, uh, I don't want to out out anyone's opinions without their permission, but hearing essentially the idea that like Amer like e e not EU, sorry, America and NATO have lost some of its teeth, um, falling, uh, especially especially after Afghanistan has. It's opened a window of opportunity for I think Putin to to roll his dice and see if if he can get away with it. And also, I mean, we need also I think before we go further is talk more about like Putin himself because it's one of those things where like he has a lot of agency and that like like this is a lot of it is 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 of his making. But history has shaped his worldview. Though. Oh, exactly. So let, let's talk yeah. about that a little bit. Yeah. He, I mean, he grew up in the Soviet Union, which. Could you could, many historians have argued was like essentially just an extension of of, of the uh, almost the dream of the Russian Empire. It's like they had everything they wanted. They had warm part water ports. The Russians ha had a vast 
influence in the Soviet Union. And he was, I mean, he was a diehard communist. He was in the KGB. And then when the Soviet Union fell apart, it's like, you know, this glorious world that you strived and that has been the vision of, of, of Russians for centuries has just collapsed. But that's the thing. So, like, you can even nuance it further. So not, not only was he in the KGB and not only was he the head of the KGB, but while he was an operative, he was in East Germany. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he was, like, on the front line of – like literally the front line of the Cold War of the, of the Soviet Union versus the West, like in Europe, yeah. like it's so mind boggling when you think about like, and I, I, I say this as like the literal definition of it, not uh, not in like uh, some sort of like um, as a euphemism, but like the like if you look at how do you create a despot, like dude, yeah. he is almost like a, and this this actually is. Uh, being colloquial, it's like he's off a, out of a comic book. He is like he's yeah. the Red Skull, man. He's the Red Skull, or he's the uh, he's the uh, you know the Lightning guy from the Fantastic Four, uh, <laughs> Doctor <laughs> yeah, Doom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Doctor yeah, Doom. Yeah, he is Victor yeah, Von Doom. Yeah, like everything about him has led us to this point. Exactly. I mean, and he's very clear in his vision. He he believes believes in Russia, believes in the Russian Empire, and believes that that. The fall of the Soviet Union was was a catastrophe that needs to be undone. Yeah, and you like you look at these old pictures of him like bare chested on the back of a horse, or like on this yacht, like with all these women. It's like, mm-hmm. dude, this is what he does. This is gray zone yeah. operations, or man. Him He's playing p- hockey and scoring five goals somehow yeah. in geriatric hockey league. Or like, it, it is not just enough to rig an election. Yeah, like he's got to get ninety nine, like one hundred percent of the votes. Like, it's all this propaganda and mm-hmm. information, mm-hmm. and it's all gray zone stuff, and, man. And, and, and to throw it on top of it, he's been es- essentially the, the leader of Russia for over over a decade now. And, like, he's he's had long-term— This is term, basically like Miguel yeah. Gorbachev, practically. Long-term geopolitical staying power, being able to, to essentially— not I mean, not because he's actively been attacked by the West, per se, but, like, survive multiple— re- "Quote unquote regime change or or leadership changes more appropriately in, in the West, and just being to, uh, like outmaneuver them because of, of of his ability to be in power for that long." Man, it's just like yeah. I, I I do feel like almost almost overwhelmed. The, yeah, there's a lot of layers to the onion. Like just like if you want to go, just keep talking about. Let's just Putin. keep going, man. Talking about nationalizing oil. Like, that was something he said in the 90s they needed to do. He mm-hmm. got power. He nationalized the oil, got it out of the uh, the oligarch hands. So now they have a massive, like, war chest just mm-hmm. based off of oil money. And they've got all the gas, too, that they can just, like, hold over anti-nuclear Germany's head. Like, hey, we're your energy supply. Mm-hmm. You're not importing that nuclear power because you hate it. You're threatening to uh, sue Poland if they build a nuclear power plant. Like... What are you get, where are you getting your energy from? Yeah. You're not ready for to get off of our gas. All right, so should so. we let, should we like, like should we really like go back like let's go to the beginning like we were talking before okay, the show yeah, started. Yeah, that's let's what, go mm-hmm. like let's talk Russo Vikings. Okay, let's, let's talk. Uh, well, let's, let's talk uh, Ottomans. Let's talk Byzantines. Let's, let's set talk. That, let's set that up too. So yeah. back to where we started. Putin uh, is talking about how Ukrainians are Russians. Yeah. So this is the context where you're going this back to the Donbass. This is the yeah. Russian yeah. speakers, yeah. the Russian culture. Like, there is no Ukraine. There is just more of us. Right. Right. Um, so he says that, but he's kind of taking, he's chopping out very select pieces of history without ignoring any of the, but while ignoring the uh, transitions, the important transitions. The but evolution he's not of wrong though. He's not so, making he's not making the shit up. He's not making it up, but he's definitely uh, manipulating. He's Man, pulling man- the strings. Manipulating also, it's important what he leaves yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. So because yeah. he is leaving out very important. It is a uh, truth, but it's not the truth. Right, right. Yeah. So going but he's all not the way back, completely out of left field. He's not. Yeah. Pol Pot. No. In yeah. in Cambodia. Going all the way back, we're gonna go back to. Yeah. What we would consider the the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, we're going back to the the Rus, the uh, well, the Kievan Rus, which was the biggest of the of the Rusin uh, tribes. I think that we could call them tribes at that clans. time. Clans, clans, yeah. yeah. So this kind of uh, these kind of step people that are uh, these are the vi- folks that the Vikings became once they started transiting into Europe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they are. 
they're wild folks. They are barons. They're they're like plains mm-hmm. barons. They're mm-hmm. uh, these just large groups of um, step people, and they acquire things. They, they don't make things. stuff. They don't make things. Right. They go out to their borders. They take what they need. At the edges of this, uh, so like the most famous of like we could think of this would be like if you think of the Mongol horde, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like this mega successful just horde of people that just came from the east, came into the west, and just like took what they wanted, did what they needed to. So before that, the Rus is the area, so it's that area of what we think of as European Russia right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and the Kievan Rus became was like the most powerful tribe that came out of that. It fractured into the Novgorod. Uh, confederacy or no federation the Novgorod Federation and the Kievan Federation and then the Muscovites came out of that and uh, became what we think of as Russia uh, so but the Kievan Rus was based you know based out of Kiev that's where it gets its name uh, but that was pre what we would think of as Ukraine mm. so but all these Rus all these Slavs this Rus and people uh, just living in the area that is ru- the Rus, like it's yeah. the western steppe. It's are they even considered Balkans at this point, or no? Oh, this is north of the Balkans. Okay. This yeah. is, um, oh, so Balkans yeah. is like a region. Right, yeah. gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. So okay. this is uh, north of the Caspian, north gotcha. of the Black right, Sea, right, north Black Sea, east it. of uh, Poland, west of the Siberia. This is also the point yeah. in the podcast where I say, dear listeners, please, if you have uh, <laughs> if you have time, pull up a map. And, uh, oh, yeah, so d- yeah. This would be great if like I'm gonna. We need to turn our our students like a war room. We need we like do, we do need that. a yeah. Marine Corps flag. Yeah. We need swords. We need maps. We like. need things to point with. Yeah, yeah. We do laser pointers yeah. for sure. And yeah. if anyone wants to buy us a camera and so we can make these uh, visual podcasts, that would be awesome too. We would also need a video editor. So. If anyone wants if to pay wants to send to me to video <laughs> editor school, <laughs> that would be lit also. If he wants to do that for free. Uh, <laughs> All right. Sorry, yeah, sorry yeah, to distract. Yeah, sorry, yeah. You anyway. were on a great train. Sorry. Anyway, so sorry. I taught history once upon a time, and it's just kind of coming out a little bit. But uh, where was I? Uh, <laughs> before I interrupted with the Balkans, so it was the federations yeah. coming together. Mm-hmm. So, but I guess so of these Rusin – uh, they they were all they went by the the, the Muscovite Rus the Kievan Rus like they were just it's just an area of the Rus plain slash forest like it's it's the steppe is in the south the forest in the north when the Kievan Rus kind of broke up it was never like a empire mm-hmm. it was just a confederation of like minded people who were tired of killing each other basically right, okay so but they never really got tired Marriage of killing of each other yeah they just kept. They just waited a while and then started doing it again. Yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, but they broke up into the Kievan Federation, which were the southern tribes, and the Novgorod Federation in the north. And the Muscovites came in and they kind of expanded, and then they became Russia when they conquered the Novgorod Federation in the north. And so that is when Russia became Russia, and Ukraine is not in that. Ukraine is southwest of that. It's about to become a land, a safe haven for uh, the Cossacks. Now, again, we're <laughs> really digging in deep here. So the Cossacks were formed when people under the Muscovite rule and under Poland-Lithuanian rule were tired of being told what to do and these harsh taxes and all this crazy s- and uh, crazy situations for serfs. If you were on the Russian side, uh, lower level merchants on the Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth side. Uh, just they kept going to war for different reasons. They kept getting pulled in. The re- taxes kept going up, or they kept getting drafted, you know, like, or uh, pressed into war. Right. Yeah. So, um, so they left. They left, and the step down south by the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, was a dangerous place. But they were able to carve out a coastal living. They became very good coastal raiders. Uh, eventually, you know, you get enough people. Eventually, women show up. Uh, you settle down. You create. Uh, little regions. Uh, fun fact: Kazakhstan and Ukraine both have the same root word through the <laughs> the, the uh, Ottoman Empire, mm. but uh, it got perverted over the years, like hundreds of years apart. But uh, for land of the free or land of the bandits, so uh, which are the same thing, I guess. Interesting, yeah. That yeah. How yeah. bandits <laughs> and free is like yeah. synonymous in, so <laughs> in history. But they eventually realized they needed to vassalize, and then this is when the Cossacks vassalize. They choose. They first choose the Polish. That was the wrong choice because the war that they did that in, they lost. So then they kind of became de facto vassals of 
the Muscovite Russians. And so when Putin's looking back in time at who is Russia, yeah. he is saying the Ukrainians are Russian. They've always been Russian. They're us. They're just an extension of us. Now, this is all pre what we would think of as nation states. Right. Now, it's hard for us to grasp it in America because we've always been a nation state. Right. It's like one of our founding principles is that we are a... a United yeah, States. Yeah, United States. But, I mean, I guess um, you could equate... If someone had um, a real... You know, we're, we're such a hodgepodge culture, too, but if if we had a truly, like, homogenous culture that was distinct from the British but still had... I maybe maybe a better way to look at it would be um uh I don't know Canada maybe where there's still a linkage to I see where you're going Vic I'm going to stop you right now because you're a little off. Am I off? Okay. Yeah, yeah. you're a little off. So um while we were becoming a nation state in America like even before uh the declaration of independence we were already kind of becoming having this an identity. State. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not as a kingdom, not right. as an empire. We were a state. N not British. With laws. Not English. Sovereign mm -hmm. land. We yeah. were. We were a state. We were America. Right. We weren't right. beholden mm -hmm. to a king, a lord, or, or anything yeah. like that. A count. Because the, just so. the geographic mm -hmm. distance, right? Like, yeah. Other and than paying taxes, yeah. you really didn't. And then, tr you know, obviously British troops walking through the streets. Yeah. So just really alignment thinking. Right. Yeah. Just It's just the, the way the future uh, England at the same time was kind of going through this transformation from kingdom to statehood mm. that really ended much later when they finally gave up Hanover, which is in Germany, uh, right? So because for the longest they were a state with a king, and the king had lands within the state, mm -hmm. and the king also had lands out in Europe. Uh, so, But they were coalescing into a state. Uh, uh, I think the Netherlands were a good early example of coalescing into a state, whereas all these kingdoms and empires in Europe are existing as lands that pyramid up to one person, mm. right? So they press down, they press down, they press down. It's a kingdom. Who you are within the kingdom doesn't matter. We exchange lands all the time through marriage. We do, you know, like the Habsburgs are a great example. Uh, so that continues all the way up. It kind of gets its death knell with World War I. And that's when we see the li rise of uh, nationalism, right. you know, Spanish Civil War, uh, which brings us yeah. back to the Ukraine, mm -hmm. and as we were there. talking about in the pre-show, is is that for that relationship, and we'll just call it big brother, little brother, yeah. for the sake of our, you know, for the, oh, which is overly simplistic, but we'll just call it that f to identify it. In that big brother, little brother relationship, little brother, what is now known as the Ukraine, was not the Ukraine, or Ukraine, Ukraine was. Well, at the time, the well, I guess it was before no, the that. The Ukraine is a, would right. be the region, right. but it's never actually been called the Ukraine. Right. That's something that we kind of added Add for it. some stupid reason in, in the 20th right. century. So, mm -hmm. so for Ukrainians, yeah. Yeah. for Ukrainians and a Ukrainian identity, they were the soldiers at the gate when the Ottomans were making their moves um, and expanding. They were right. I mean, they, they were, were the not front line. White, no, no that's Hungary. Wasn't that's Hungary. Well, well Romania um, so and Bulgaria. So Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, all that. Yeah, those those were kingdoms that were um, diplomatically dealing with uh, the Ottomans because they didn't want to be invaded. Yeah. So or they within didn't Ukraine, it. remember, Ukraine wasn't a, a place. There was the Ukrainian people, right? But Ukraine was. Was just a land. land like right. it, there was nobody really real ownership of it. This is around that same time mm -hmm. we're talking about the, like the Cossacks. There were the Tartars, yes, which okay. were about the same thing, but they were allied with the Ottomans. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and from there, mercenaries came. Like that was just a wild. You think of the Wild West. This was wilder than that. Mm -hmm. This was just a lawless land of lawlessness. Where if you went in there, you better have you better be yeah. packing. You better right. be ready to defend yourself. You know how to set up a quick fortification. Because if someone sees you and decides they don't want to deal with you, they'll just turn you into a slave. Right. Mm -hmm. or, so murder, or just everything. murder you. Yeah. But usually you get more money out of selling to somebody. You just uh, castrate them real quick and sell them to the Ottomans. Yikes. Um, so it was a wild, lawless land. But out of that came excellent, excellent horsemen, excellent cavalry, excellent light cavalry um, that were complemented the armies of both the Ottomans and Europe the Europeans very well. And that's kind of where Ukraine was. Mm -hmm. 
So, but because of where they were on the other side of the lake, the <laughs> there was a Black Sea, the yeah. Caspian Sea, they were uh, very much on the Christian side. Mm-hmm. So, so from an early worldview, then it's fair to say though that they found their identity was in the Rus. Yes. Not in the European and not in the yeah they were they were not in the, in the caliphate yeah because mm-hmm. the Rus wasn't in Europe right so um, they were then the the ones holding back the tide against these foreign invaders well no? or like, no, it was, well so, so that, that would imply that um, at that time the Ottomans were essentially interested in going there it looked from uh, from what I understanding of that period of history they're going obviously towards towards more uh, central central Europe they were already that was in the direction Spain. yeah they already had Spain so they, it's almost like a like a, a two pronged two pronged advance and then uh so like I, I don't think they had any at that at that point in time you could say that the, the ambition was not to go further east it was more to go to go west so i guess so it, it was also not a religious deal for the ottomans at the time like they used religion but they were an evolved enough uh empire that it was almost always diplomatic right it was almost always something about trade in the mediterranean or something like access access yeah. and every once in a while like a very uh islam minded uh, right. sultan would come along but so guess what? Sh- the the religion part comes in at the end when there's a re- when they've already justified when why the useful. states are going to right. war. Yes. Yeah. Once it's useful. So. so I guess what I'm trying to establish here in this you know the flash forward to today is is some of the stuff that Putin is claiming about this relationship between that he's trying to solidify and that he's justified in using force to maintain this idea that Russians and Ukrainians are one. Is how much truth historically is there to that? I think eight percent. So I'm gonna eight percent. Here's what <laughs> That's I'll very exact, here, man. <laughs> here's what I'll say. Say if you're a Russian, it's true. If you're a Ukrainian, it's false because Not from if, if you're a Russian. Um, Oligarch, it's true. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay. To be fair, Russian right. surf, it's not. As, like, it's if just, well, like, yeah, like, or the more like Russian, like national, like, the more yeah. nationalist Russians who, because like, Putin's in power for a reason. He does have legitimate support from a lot of people. I like, said surf in front of modern people. I apologize. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. So <laughs> I mean, from a historian, yeah. regardless of Ukrainian, mm-hmm. Russian, his, from a historian trying to understand what's happening, is there some validity to what he's saying? So here's what I'll say without having someone from my school burn my degree um (laughs) i would say it's it's true in the sense that there was there's a a strong back and forth relationship it's false in the sense where the ukrainian identity is wholly wed to russia yeah and i'm so it's a one-way street yeah. Like, uh, yeah. So if the Russians if you're like, gonna, you're, you're part of our family, and Ukrainians, for the most part, throughout history, have been like, no, we're not even like second cousins. Yeah. yeah, we acknowledge yeah. you, but you're we're our not neighbor, Russian. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That is yes. Let's dilute it down. If we're going to tell somebody on the street something in five seconds, yes. Okay. Yeah. Instead of the 15 minute history lesson I just gave. Yeah. So. No, <laughs> it's, it's so good, I, I, and I think it helps I, us understand. Yeah. So if, if I was on Twitter, I would say no, but it's complicated. <laughs> like. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, that's what I tell uh, my wife when she asks if some chores are done. <laughs> but yeah, so after World War One, we have the rise of the Soviet Union, uh, and they collect all the surrounding uh, uh, satellite states. Uh, what do they? What do they call them? Um, I can't. I can't remember what. Colonel Woodbridge literally just used the word. Well, we're talking like former Soviet. Countries. So when the Ru- so when the Russian Federation became the, uh, the uh, Russian Empire became like the Soviet Empire, like they had they had a word for it, and I just blanked on it. I just had a, or something. That's what we would call it in the West. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but like. Oh, they had a. They had they have a word for it. Um, you'd think I would know it too because they used it in Warhammer Three, which just came out. <laughs> and I was playing that, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but so, and of those. A lot of them are internal to Russia and are very Russian, but the external ones, as the statehood thing happened, as this rise of state, you know, nation states, that's why Russia, the the Russian part of the Soviet Union is like, yeah, we don't want to deal with the Ukrainian 
politics. We just need to make sure that they're communists and part of us. So you are a state within us. Yeah. So you are a satellite Ukrainian state. Um, I'm trying to remember where all where all it reaches. Kazakhstan, you are you are state. Um, Mongolia would have been, but they didn't bother uh, mm -hmm. because you know I think at the time like 800,000 people lived there. It wasn't really. Yeah. We're but dealing with, but, but there was a, a russification process. This is part of the reason why this mm -hmm. problem exists. Because again, like I would argue that the Soviet Union was less of like a communist revolution, more just like a a a a, a, a different different face to just Russian Empire. Yeah, and that took decades and a world war to really help start hammering home. But even then, when the uh, Soviet Union fell, all these satellite states immediately just immediately identified with their nation. You know, the nation is a group of people who have self-identity. Yeah, the Tajiks, the Uzbeks, yeah. the Kazakhs. They all Kazakhs immediately are like, we're yeah. not in Russia. We're our own country. And Ukraine was one of those. Yeah, Ukraine immediately was one of those. Was like, mm -hmm. yeah. out. They're like, we're done. We're, we are Ukrainian. Yeah. So just in the context of not picking and choosing from history, Putin is just wrong flat on his face. Just because he ignores the rise of states, he yeah. ignores all this... Yeah, they didn't have to happened. think about it. Yeah, when the Soviet Union fell, they were like Russia's over there, Ukraine's over Deuces. here. Yeah. yeah, yes, and it, it, to the point where Belarus, Belarus is its own thing. Like they identified as Belarusian, even though there is no one more pro-Russia than Belarus. Right, we're seeing that play out right yeah, now right. with uh, Lukashenko or uh, what his name is, um, the Putin. Oh wait, I wrote it down. Lukashenko, <laughs> uh, the. Uh, Putin contemporary in Belarus, uh, just like, hey, come on in. And so is that what up. is that what Putin's trying to do? Is he's trying to have the Ukrainians be Belarus 2.0? I think in an ideal world, that's exactly what he wants. Yeah. I don't think he would ever take Ukraine as more Russia, but if he could have Ukraine as more Belarus, that is just ideal. Right. Because so. they're not going to tear down the borders and change maps. Like it'll, yeah. In his world, you well, they'll still be well, there Ukraine. Is, there is some maps that, that are trying to be changed at the moment, which is why he's the, the Donbass. How does it pronounce it? Dom, Donbass, I think. Donbass region. Um, that's part of, I guess, the issue is to ch is to change the map. So, I mean, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll uh, it, But again, we'll he, see. Those but are this invasion into, like, yeah. Kiev and things, he's not trying to expand Russian borders. He's just trying to bring Ukraine back mm -hmm. into He's their good. He purview. wants to, uh, I mean, within a few days probably, he'll have Kiev. He'll install a puppet government. It'll be very pro-Russian. It will probably won't even be Ukrainian nationals right. um, in all the non-figurehead posts. Right, he'll right. find some impo uh, some Ukrainians to fill the figurehead posts. And then Which is similar to what they did in Afghanistan when they first invaded and called it a mm -hmm. success was yep. is that – they started instilling. Uh, I mean, when I was in Marja, the governor at the time uh, was the governor of Marja was a former communist. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. And then, um, so that will be pretty much what they're, he wants to do in Ukraine. Uh, I imagine because uh, Ukraine's been so in the public eye, it'll be a lot more difficult to do than he probably wants it to do, but. Once he's in there and he's got his, his feet down, and it's just a waiting game to see what the West will even bother with. So, because... <sighs> um, so, I did have a couple questions I wanted to write down. I wrote down that I wanted to tee, tee up for you guys. Shoot. Um, so, looking at recent history, I guess it's even not that recent, because I'm going to take us back to uh, the 70s and 80s, but it seems to me that there's a trend that when countries have some s success early success that they then want to uh, um, continue to push and extend expand and capitalize on that success I mean Vietnam after having repelled both US and China then turned their teeth and towards and France for well I guess France twice. Mm -hmm. U.S. and then China, they then turn turn their ire onto the rest of Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we did that after you know early success in Afghanistan. We then turned to Iraq, um, and now we've got Russia. After what you could call a successful campaign mm -hmm. in Syria, is now 
And then obviously in Crimea, annexing Crimea, you know, now we've got this full on invasion of, of, of a sovereign country. Um, does that does that stand up historically? I mean, you or is that a recent sort well, of a modern? No, that definitely like you can go as far back as you want to go. They don't. No one ever knows when to stop. Like, let's well, look World at World War yeah. One was a good was yeah. a, was it was World War One the 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 outlier? Is that well, where yeah. everyone's like we're not doing this again? World War One is 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 different in the sense where, like, in terms because it wasn't really like you could. A lot of like British, um, like British historians of 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 like slightly before our generation earlier, um, from their perspective, that Germany was the aggressor, would would make that or would would could could argue that Germany was trying to was was getting some territories and then trying to push their luck more on the continent. I don't th- I th- I think what we're seeing right now with Ukraine currently at least is more akin to um, at the moment. Um, like World War Two than World War One. Like for instance, if World War One had just been Austria Hungary, Aust- the Austro Hungarian Empire taking over Serbia, and that was it, then then I, I think that could be like a, a better comparison. But um, World War, but, but how World War One devolved would was when you had these major powers at this like sort of gambling, I guess, on 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 whether they could sustain their influence in Europe, and th- this became like a crisis flashpoint for that to happen. If that makes sense, like yeah, Germany yeah. was afraid of Russia expanding. Russia was always afraid of Germany expanding. Britain and France were sp- ex- afraid of Russia and Germany expanding, but they're more afraid of Germany at the time because they were going to have a naval power, yeah. and 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 they all had their major worldwide terrible, you know, evil empires that they were really concerned about. So it's 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 kind of hard, I guess. I, I guess from our modern historiography to really point the finger in the right direction, just because especially um, there's still a lot of quote unquote hurt feelings over World War One sure. that that are gonna be hard to, to, to get past for a lot of people. But uh so f- I I mean but I I I think World War Two is a good example for what we were mentioning with like, you know, H- Hitler finding a piece of territory, gambling on on Western powers or uh, you know, failing to live up to the um the Treaty of Versailles and then just all right, well it worked here, will it work here, will it work here? And it just kept working to the point when at some point the allies drew drew a line at poland and even though they drew the line it's sort of, it was kind of similar it, it, um to our facing out like that they, they drew a line at poland but they didn't do anything about yeah. it there's there's like that phony war period mm. and then they didn't even try to seize the initiative they germany took the initiative and then knocked out france um, right right so i, I think there i mean there is i mean it we're forgetting, like, like the the person with the most agency in Russia in this situation is Putin, like wholeheartedly, and he 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 he's a powerful man. He's no, he knows he's powerful, and he's, you know, the past you know several years has rolled the dice in a few situations, uh, you know, taking t- essentially taking over Crimea, mm-hmm. and, and this is like the next piece, and, and so he's up for re-election. Re-election, now. and for those who can't see, I'm air quoting big time. <laughs> so he's up for air re-election in 2024. He he, in, he installs he installs you know assuming this works out in his favor, he gets you know essentially makes two new countries uh, of of the of the Donbass region, and then you will he'll go the the next level you know using information warfare start trying to tear apart NATO at the seams, and then you'll start you could potentially start seeing these. The similarly no rinse and repeat pattern used in the future, like bushfire type stuff. Or yeah, I mean, yeah, it's 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 pretty like full on. Um, well, it, it starts. You, it would start by with with bushfires. You know, there'd be for some uh, you know, whatever neighboring country Lithuania is or Lithuania. Or like, oh, there's a Russian minority group in this country, or they're being impressed by the Western government, and then you know, using information warfare and and you know, propping up, you know, like little their little green men that we see in the Gazette articles a lot. You know, yeah. send them in, make the situation worse, and then make it to the point where oh, we now we have to get involved again. And at what point? Um, yeah. Again, this is speculative. This is the world according to William, uh, Vic, and Nick. So yeah, totally we, interpreted by, not according to. Yeah, yeah interpreted <laughs> yeah, yeah. by the adaptation. Yeah. Part, yeah. yeah. So obviously, I obviously I don't want to just just take any claims or because the most interesting I think historians do is try to make claims for the future. I think that's really outside mm-hmm. of my um, professional training. But hey, it's always fun to speculate. I like I like reading alternate histories every once in a while, you know. So it's 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 interesting to do this and and to to hypothesize. But um, again, we're not going to know until yeah. it happens. But if 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 you know 
if if I could go on and and gamble on what Putin's next move, like you know, lay a, a you know a few thousand dollars on the line, uh, I would definitely see that as being if Ukraine works successful for be uh, being his future. Well, yeah, I see that, and like Poland is freaking out. Oh yeah. So Poland, okay. So part of the attack, if we want to just talk about Poland for a second, part yeah. of the attack was Belarus had been holding back a whole ton of immigrants for a while. And the morning of the attack, which remember, happened right after the Olympics ended, they just unleashed waves of immigrants on the border of Poland. So Poland is tied up trying to deal with those guys uh, in advance of whoever's going to be coming in from Ukraine. Uh, so Belarus has been doing their little dirty work, too. And they've been practicing it for the past year and a half or so, bringing immigrants to the border with Poland. And this time they just kind of held back for about six or eight weeks, and then they just let them all go at once. And that's, I guess, why we have so. I thought the, the uh, 82nd Airborne was, uh, or yeah. parts of it were sent to mm-hmm. Poland to help with that. Yeah. A, and on, on top of the fact, excuse me, that the res- refugee crisis is going to obviously not get any better yeah. in the coming like, days. I definitely think that we need to spend some time unpacking what does this mean for us? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and what is like what does this mean for our international state? But I did I have one more question I wanted to ask you guys, or at least the topic to tee up. Well, actually, add two. Sorry. Is it overly simplistic to see this as democracy versus totalitarianism, or is there something more complicated here? Beyond, or is it ov- also overly simplistic to say, "Hey, this is just a despot trying to solidify power"? I mean, it, that's 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 the question. Like, the first one there, might be, the second one might not be. But is well, okay. So, is there a a version of this where if you're Russian, this is a good move for Russians and not just for Putin. So kind of to answer that question on its face, um, within Russia, Putin has uh, the – I don't know if it was Putin directly or the Kremlin has said that any anti-war protest would be treated right. as I criminal saw that. Yeah, they're going to crack down. Yeah. yeah, so they did a pre-crackdown – crackdown on any potential rioting that might happen as an anti-war thing. Or even to demonstrate. Yeah, because it's not popular amongst the lower classes in Russia to go to war with Ukraine because they cross the border to work. They cross the border for basic food supplies. Um, China had to start, I can't remember if they were importing wheat or or getting wheat from Russia because it's not going to Ukraine anymore, to or from, right? So they needed to buy it, so... It had to have a place to go. And it's just so and they don't want to f- have the sanctions and they don't want to deal with the international fallout. And they have businesses online that Americans like to t- partake in, you know, like uh, World of Tanks or something like that. That's a Russian company that is trying to do business outside of Russia. So the working class of Russia is not totally on board with what they're doing when the military and Putin right. is up to. So, but yeah, this pre-crackdown thing where they, I can't remember how they classify it. So they have criminal classifications and it's like not the lowest one. It's like, it's up the rung a little bit. So yeah, it's still a misdemeanor in our, so to use our parlance, th- so it would be a misdemeanor, but. No, it would be a crime. In our parlance, it would be a low level crime. Oh, yeah, okay. So, so it's be, actual criminal It's actual activity. crime. It's yeah. not something yeah. you're just going to get You're a going ticket. to get a like 10,000 ruble fine and go to jail, jail. for two weeks. Like it's, <laughs> it's not. And that's just for being out on the street. And I think they also authorize use of lethal force. So, so this is um, so then there is no lens where this is a good move for Russia. For Russia, yeah, for Russians especially, right. yeah, because they're going to get hit by. But sanctions this is Putin. Then, this is yeah. all Putin. This is and so and he's trying to play a long game, and he's obviously he's exactly got he's viewing it as long term gains for short term loss. And I mean, and and he, I mean, we brought up a good point earlier like the people who are going to suffer most from the sanctions are not necessarily going to be the oligarchs or in the head right. it's going to be the average because per- if you're rich in russia you're going to get what's coming to you regardless like you're yeah, you, mm-hmm. you, yeah. they'll yeah. be yeah and even if you get cut mm-hmm. off you're hoarding you're yeah. Not, yeah you're not handing out so unless the u.s and the eu just seize all their assets which they have a lot of assets in our banks and uh but they probably have a bunch in russia yeah, but I'm like sure even even if you did that, like you take out what thirty percent, you're not really even kneecapping them at yeah. that point. You're just like, oh, well, you're it's definitely just, a yeah. symbolic so, yeah. gesture. One. All right, yeah. I guess so. My last question then um, is, does this embolden China? And I know this is probably more of a, well, a Hunziker kind you of question. Well, if you saw in the news today, there is um, nine. I think uh, I think there was nine Chinese uh, planes in Taiwanese 
like uh, like their air defense space. Um, so I didn't see that. Yeah, because I mean, as far as I understand it, the the corollaries between Russia, Ukraine, and China, Taiwan are almost identical. One sees them yeah. as, hey, yeah. this is ours. Mm-hmm. You're ours. We're all one. We're yeah. all here. Yeah, if we're yeah. paying with broad brush strokes, I mean, the other guys yeah. are like, no, yeah. we're sort of neighbors. Yeah, dude. you have to zoom mm-hmm. in quite a ways before it starts to be different. So, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I definitely see that. So, mm-hmm. yeah, if you're paying with broad brush strokes, I think you could you could definitely make. Obviously, I think the important intricate details do matter, but for our, for our general audiences, like who has no idea of, of or much information on either. I think you definitely yeah. tie similarities too. And I mean, in, in China, their big threat or their trigger lines are us encroaching too much onto their ab- ability to mm-hmm. move freely and yep. ex- uh, assert their influence, well, which is the exact same thing that Putin is saying about NATO coming too much into... But kind of the difference between china and russia is russia's economy is really strong right now because of the oil Mm. because oil prices have gone up over the last three or four years and um like well they're skyrocketing now they're they're skyrocketing (laughs) now but when oil is cheap russia is weak when oil is expensive russia is strong uh china on the other hand is not is a much more robust economy but it is shaky right now they've got a ton of domestic mm. it's very issues. shaky right now you look yeah. at the uh, evergrand crisis and there's about three more like on its heels that are just trillion dollar crises just right. massive econ- economic well stuff. then the pandemic obviously is yeah yeah the pandemic really stuff and if we just we would <laughs> it would be hard to stomach because our products are so much cheaper because of china but if we just like pulled all business out of china china is in a very bad place right so they they they've been walking this tightrope for a while now, but they're probably getting jittery anyway because they're like, as things get bad internally, Tibet starts to become a problem again. Uh, they lose control of the uh, the Yeager region region yeah. up in the northwest mm-hmm. there, uh, that region up in north of, uh, I guess we'd call it Manchuria, but I think it's northern Manchuria is shaky anyway. They they're used to a certain well, amount Hong of autonomy. Kong. Hong Kong is a yeah. biannual demonstration. Yeah, of some Hong sort. Kong's a yeah. problem. And then it's like, if we don't get Taiwan now, when do we get it? Because mm-hmm. internal problems are going to start becoming a problem. Yeah, it really just depends on what their long term short growth goal turns. And if they're really just to, to, to roll the dice and go all in. And that's, I, don't, so. I don't see, although I think they're cut from the same jib, I feel like, uh, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pronounce his name right, but Z, President Z, is mm-hmm. not. He's playing the long game. Yeah. Whereas Putin seems more hell bent on short term. There's uh, also, I mean, the rumors, which I don't know how, how, because they are calling them rumors and not facts, but I mean, rumors that Putin's health declining and that mm, that yeah. that could also, I mean, again, like, yeah, how much how much do you want to attribute that to this? I I wouldn't say yeah. much, but it's something that could be considered. Yeah. We can only take so many trips into the Lazarus yeah. pit. I mean, Descent, we saw yeah, that yeah. from uh, Ra's al Ghul. <laughs> you know, he eventually goes crazy. Uh, Descent into. Uh, yeah, descent into madness. Descent <laughs> that also matches a uh, descent amongst the ranks yeah. uh, in Russia. So, I've heard that too. I haven't seen any of it substantial. But I thought, but I thought yeah. our discussion earlier uh, with Colonel Woodbridge, his idea though that like you know we're talking worldviews and justifications and all these things, but like this just sort of fatalistic. Like there's been mm-hmm. so much suffering. In this area for so long, and so many death spots, and and, and to kind of clear up, you talk about the Ukrainians, how they're going to react to, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it's, I, I think when we're talking the region, though, I think it resonates. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of cultural overlap. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. I think, um, so uh, what we were talking about earlier with Maslow's the Colonel, higher yeah. of need, hierarchy of needs, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, dude, if I can eat and it's warm in the winter and cool in the summer, man, like, why am I gonna? I mean, what am I? What's the What's yeah. the benefit of me getting involved in yeah. trying to? And that might uh, be another this. big difference between Taiwan and Ukraine is I think the Taiwanese are ready to fight. So there's de- they're definitely down for the saber rattling. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll say that. I mean, it, so. talking I mean, to Doctor Hunziker though, I mean, there might be some. Like, everyone's hardcore until you get bullets. punched in the face. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah, then you're yeah. just like, uh, do I want this again? Yeah. Like, Everybody's an awesome boxer until you get punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and again, like I mean. Everyone we has for, a play until they get punched in the yeah, face. Yeah, like yeah. For, for the most, like, no, I don't, I don't want to, like, bring everyone into this, but, like, for, like, for, for most people, like, you're growing up in, like, the safest, most secure time in human history. 
like for for on average i mean like it's just reason, not being hunted yeah just being mm-hmm. able to get food yeah just yeah. very yeah. basic i get clothes i can get new clothes i can get shoes i can get fed there's this magical thing called yeah. air conditioning in some places yeah. like yeah the and leading it, cause of death in america is obesity I need to this isn't just america yeah, fact <laughs> check that. this isn't just america except i think you're talking globally, globally. per no, capita there, there are a lot yeah per, there yeah. are a, a infinite number of exceptions right. to what, right. what i just said but like for like a lot of people, it's like growing up in rel- uh, relative to what it was, but like in, in the previous century, like comfort and safety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you take the richest people, just in America, would have more the poorest wealth. No, do you take the richest people in America have oh, more okay. wealth than the entire rich of an entire history yeah. up to this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's just in America. Yeah. So that's what, I think that's what you're getting at mm-hmm. is is that, yeah, we're not so being hunted and we don't have to hunt. The, exactly. Uh, the poorest in, the poorest strata of America, is better off than upper yeah, that's middle class would have been yeah, 150 years right, ago. That's the mm-hmm. other. They have better access to food and resources yeah. and. But um, let's talk well, about. Wait, I, actually, sorry, sorry, no, I just had one other question. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the third, just one other question. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm like looking <laughs> at this stuff like. Is this the new Cold War? Okay. It's um, pretty warm right now. So, I, again, I am try to balance my rationality, my irrationality all the, all the time when looking at things. And it's, it's difficult in this day and age, especially with misinformation um, going out there. But, like, I would maybe not – I mean, I, I wouldn't – how would I – I would phrase it as I would say, like, the post-Cold War geopolitical era is over. I would say, like, from looking at from fall of the Berlin Wall, including the war, like the the, the era of global war on terrorism, to to where we are now, I think that was a a definite period of time in the sense where, like, it's it's like the we we're driven by the 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 quote unquote peace of of the Cold War, and I think that per I think we're just in a new just complete era where where we're gonna view geopolitics very differently than we have in the past. 40, 40, 30 years. Yeah, there might be a, a re-shakedown of the order here over the next 5, 10, Now, are we talking years. globally or just in Europe? Um, oh, def- definitely in Europe. Uh, I, I mean, the fact that, I mean, like, as an, as, like, I think I mentioned earlier, like, as a, as a American, you know, always viewing, like, you know, America and Europe, you know, we're pretty socially, politically stable. Like, I, I don't see any big wars happening here or there anytime soon. And, 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 that's different now like my 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 thoughts of that it it, it has 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 changed completely like mi6 and and uh mi5 and cia are all dusting off old playbooks you think um i I don't think i'm I'm informed enough to 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 answer to answer that question but i mean i think maybe not i mean potentially and then i think also writing new books i mean there is again the cyber element has changed everything the social media element has changed everything and also, like the ability to do deep fakes, has 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 altered everything. Mm-hmm. So, I I, th- I think uh, I mean I g- some things change, some things don't. But I think there's there's a lot of of, of of new coming into this this era. I think I think you could definitely say, like, a Cold War, two point oh. But um, I it, I think it might be too early to tell. I just think like the 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 major. I guess historical events that driven the past four years, like that that sort of series of events has has changed and altered, and now we're into something new. In in, in my rambling, incoherent way no, of no. saying, no, like, no, the the pause was I shit myself a little bit because that's fucking frightening. Yeah, anything cyber is frightening, really, to me. Like just an expansion I'm a, I'm a, expansion of gray zone operations yeah. and like this like prospect of like. You know this this new proxy war issue that we might fall or find ourselves falling yeah. into, like at least for the Marine Corps, like hey, dust off your small wars journal again, like yeah. well, definitely small, small wars man. <laughs> we, we like what, like, uh, dude? This is I, gnarly. Yeah. I definitely recommend for all our Marine listeners out there, which hopefully is the majority of you, uh, definitely dust off that small wars journal and uh, write for the Gazette. Yeah. Also, I mean, oh, again, oh, I love plugging Gazette on, on this podcast. Um. Take time, uh, scholars, writers, Marines, anyone who you know chooses to waste their time listening to us. Like, 
document. What do you mean be full, yeah. fully fulfilled? As your, uh, as your executive us. producer here, William, I need you to stop saying wasting time with that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, no, but no, this is a perfect opportunity to analyze what the hell is going on in, in, with Russia and Ukraine right now. What is Russia doing? What have they done successfully? What's failed? What are their strategies? What are their tactics? Write this down, get it in paper, and get it out there to as many people as possible. Like, it, this, is, this is, like, like use, the, use what Again, I don't want to be an alarmist. I don't want to say World War III is happening because right. there's a lot. Could, uh, it, 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 a million things could pan out in a million yeah. different of ways. Of all the things that get dust up, don't dust but, up the doomsday yeah. clock. I but mean, that, yeah, in in the era of, of of this new great power competition, it is the most important to disseminate what is happening right now and then figure out ways to counter it. Like it, it is the, so study study this stuff. Study the Armenian yeah. uh, Azerbaijan war. Study this this Ukrainian Russo war. Figure out what is being done and 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 how to deter it and fight against it. Um, speaking of which, I think we can. Uh, I, I guess as we end, do a more like current discussion, like what is actually transpired in, well, in the past twenty four hours. Is get on the MCA website, check out our web articles because they're. I mean, we I think we talked about this mm-hmm. in a, a couple episodes ago, but there's a tremendous article in there about the amphibious assault. Or the potential amphibious assault of the Ukraine. Exactly. So get in there and look at this stuff. Yeah, there's dude, this is a crazy, crazy time. So yeah, let's let's talk about that a little bit. So I for all 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 of um who listened to the last episode we talked about Ukraine, how I've been basically tweaked from South Park in terms of being afraid <laughs> of Ukraine. Last night was a very sleepless night. Um I was just on on Twitter, Reddit, social media, on t- and reading news sources constantly, getting updates on the actual invasion. So how it seems to have panned out is, um, uh, as Colonel Woodbridge says, the um, the Black Sea Fleet concentration, potentially amph- amphibious assault on Ukraine, was the was the red herring mm-hmm. to use a, a fish and mm-hmm. water yeah. reference. Yeah, it was a, um, it was a total feint. It was the perfect yeah, feint. Yeah, because I mean, is there's only so many uh, ways to get in Ukraine, but you have to you can't as as Ukrainian you know, um, person in charge of defense, you have to delegate where you think they're actually going to attack versus where you where you think so i think the the black sea fleet concentration was was like as, as colonel Wivich so eloquently said like what was it here's my thumb and what and now you're dumb or something so the thumb yeah. the, the distraction you know well, like it says like uh, peter b parker says in spider-verse don't watch the mouth watch the hands exactly <laughs> so so I, I i think that uh judging by the actors now it could be a faint or it could be something that comes in later but uh, it, it appears that um there's been a lot of uh, uh, Russian armor advances into Ukraine. There is a uh, they've also using um, airborne troops. Like they've they've uh, from what I've seen on social media, they've gone in and taken over a uh, civilian airport. Was yeah, it another airport? And, and rocketed and, the airbase. And mm-hmm. yeah, and I've, so, I've there was like this British journalist who's like in the background. There's Russian paratroopers. Like dear God, like bl- bless him, man. He yeah. he's gonna need it. Um, uh. I've seen like from a lot of Ukrainian social media. I've seen like uh, videos of uh, Russian vehicles burning. There's been images of ca- captured pris- of Russian prisoners. All these dudes are in their twenties and definitely don't want to f- look like they don't want to be there at all. Yeah. I mean, I, I I couldn't. Well, it looks like the ground invasion was the first wave was re- was repulsed, but the air, the helicopters coming in was not right. was not able to be stopped. So. Dude, it's like Red Dawn. You guys, are, the original, not the <laughs> well, remake. Well, that's what dude, we're talking like, about. Cause, um, insane. Yeah. yeah. Well, b- the issue is now it's um, like recently, like I don't, it's not like f- like a full right, but like the Ukrainian government essentially like gave, let people have I guess access to weapons to defend themselves. I'm like, it's at this point, it's like too. It might be too little, too yeah. late. I, I think mean, Colonel Woodward just said something. So like the yeah. things that could have been done. Weren't. Yeah. And back to your point earlier about them just not wanting to bother, like just. Bad stuff happens if we pick up these guns. Like yeah, they yeah. probably wouldn't even take them if they had the option. And so. but, Dude, it's but so something we can also consider is I remember I was reading like uh, um, some discussions on Af- uh, Russians in Afghanistan and like uh, like essentially like, you know when the Russians initially invaded you know the 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 Mujahideen and the Afghani's are you know killing a lot of low level people and the Russian population could take that but then they started you know targeting officers and other mm-hmm. higher who are part of like the Russian oligarchy. And had more influence. So what I've no what, what we heard from Colonel Woodbridge is like the units attacking Ukraine right now are more like their their upper echelon and quality of troops, like these these uh in, like brigades, you know, um and of 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 units who are are, are better trained. So we're seeing all, like 
I, from what from what I gather and what I've seen, it's like the cream of the Russian military is getting is 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 involved in, in taking hits and casualties, and that and a lot of these officers, you know, are, are, I imagine were from like the Russian oligarch class. So if if a good um, you know um, what what. Defense or insurgency. Yeah, if a good insurgency was 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 practical, and you start you know picking off these guys, yeah. it, it could have real effect. But from what, what we gather from our my com- our conversation with Colonel Woodbridge earlier, who is also a great wealth of information, and yeah, we're gonna uh, try to get him on to get talk him on and talk about yeah. Ukraine. But um, yeah, I mean there there's there's not much in a way that the average Ukrainian civilian could do just because they've been a largely unarmed population there might be you know a few crazies mm-hmm. with like you know world war ii weapon stashes or or cold war era stashes here and there but and what's th- interesting about that too is at the fall of the soviet union they were armed to the teeth they had they had nukes they had nukes uh they had an ak in every living room but dude that was 1990 they, yeah that yeah. was 1990 they uh and and so and Colonel Woodbridge yeah. talking about like sort of the dynamics of the region and how children are raised and how mm-hmm. you know the grandparents raise the kids so that the and I I, 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 I again check our sources because uh, this was just a conversation we had as we were gearing up for this so I, I don't know enough about the region but uh, he seems like a wealth of information so I, I, I have no reason to doubt that there's some truth to this but like if this sort of knowledge passes down across generations. Mm-hmm. Um, then you are looking at people who grew up during the Cold War. So, yeah, even if it has been 30 years, 40 years, there was the, the, the generations that would understand what life was like yeah. then are still very much vibrant and, yeah. and yes. And remember, active. when Ukraine gained its independence, they weren't a Western ally. Right. They were just an independent, recently Former, yes. pre, yeah. pre-Soviet yeah. country. So yeah. it took years for them to kind of be – Start inching closer to Western ideals, and right as they're getting to the doorstep, that's when Russia's going to come right. in and just flip it around. And I guess sort of so. one of the drawbacks, I guess, of a populist movement is we're talking about Putin and all of this. And, and I guess to get to your point is if, sure, uh, you know, everybody's a tough guy until they get punched in the face, but even tough guys can only handle mm-hmm. so many bloody noses, yeah, right? Exactly. And so with a populist movement, if it's not a f- tremendous success if it's not a hundred percent vote mm-hmm. uh, right off the bat do they start to lose interest in this well we'll see because if it is going back to all the way to our conversation you can have this thing come full circle is is that if there isn't truth or a lot at least from the the russian worldview that ukrainian people and russian people are one then if they get a bloody nose too many times will they want like does is this gamble? Does it not pay yeah. off for yeah. Putin? So I that's that's part of it. because oh, yeah. that's like the good thing of the age of social media, where like I'm I I'm, I'm we are able to see footage and and pictures and images, mm-hmm. minutes minutes yeah. in almost real time after they happen. So if it, and and Putin might might realize you know like the the old tricks of tr- how you suppress populations may not work in the age of social media anymore. Mm-hmm. Like it's mm-hmm. it's. So if if his invasion, you know, kills too many people or damages too much infrastructure or he's unable to secure you know, keep, early yeah, victory, your right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like it could just it could backfire exponentially. Um, and then it, it, and if he has nothing to show for for his effort for the you know the the, the families of the of the dead Russians, it, 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 who knows? Yeah, I mean. Social media. How many during the Arab Spring? How many despots were toppled by social media and oh. WhatsApp and many? Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, many. I mean, they had at least half a dozen. Right. Like, yeah, hey, this could be a Pearl Harbor moment for Ukrainians. This is it could be like, I mean, I, so Colonel Rubich was saying like the percentage wise, he'd argue, you know, ten percent diehard Russian, ten percent diehard Ukrainian, eighty percent just wants to live. But I mean, if if this is like a a big Pearl Harbor mo- unifying moment for Ukraine people, like yeah. a, like a nation defining yeah. moment, this could, this could be it. Well, because of those eighty percent uh, that just want to live, they're almost entirely uh, all of them Ukrainian. are being targeted by Ru- yeah. Russia. Like, and so if push comes to shove and they can't just get by, they are going to be on the side of Ukraine. I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's there's because already that's, been that's how they lean anyway. There's already report, been yeah. reports of tons of civilian casualties, and like you know, yep. I know for a fact if any of my family were killed in like a Russian strike, that would p- 
piss me sure. off. I mean, that, like, that, that's, that's like counterinsurgency 101, yeah. well, at least according mm-hmm. to uh, you know certain experts, is, is that you kill one, one insurgent, you just made two more. Yeah. Yep. So, anyhow. Yep. Well, dude. All right. Well, we this like, was an awesome discussion. Like we said, we can't keep up with news on the ground, but, man, mm-hmm. we covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Well, you guys helped um, learn me something today. Oh, man. I, I feel like I learned a lot as well. Yes. Yeah, so again, we, we ask our dear dear listeners, please do more research. Please educate and write yourself. In. Write, write in. in. Yeah. And, I mean, this... If if you want hot in the press straight, I I, I we will happily push this forward. And I hope you enjoyed this uh, hour and whatever of us talking without mentioning a single political figurehead in America. We did a fantastic job, guys. I'm proud of mm-hmm. us. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, to be golf fair, clap, like golf clap. Yes. we don't we don't we don't also don't know like where like the, the hey. full scope of things. Oh, no, so I have it set up. So, but, but yeah, we, again, we I, have I, a clap in the thing. <laughs> a a a, mul- a multi pronged approach to educating yourself is always recommended. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, share this along if you found it helpful, and uh, let's just try and get the education out there. So. Yeah, I mean. We are just three guys. We're three awesome guys. Yeah. yeah. But we're three guys. Only one of us actually has the paperwork to show some uh, authority I, and authenticity. Has the certificate on the wall. I did <laughs> not get my degree in understanding Ukrainian and Russian history. It's a very much a, like I, a lot of historical topics for me are hobbies. Like I, 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 I am, I'm knowledgeable and, and intimately knowledgeable in very specific subjects, but like. I had to do a lot of last minute research yeah. before coming yeah. into here. Yeah, we were supposed to record an hour before, but I was like, "Hold up, I gotta." Yeah. Yeah. I gotta look but that at being this. said, I will say that if you're listening to us, I am fairly certain we're in the top twenty percent of knowledge, maybe. So better than listening to uh, the lady at the Seven Eleven talk. If about anything, it. Yeah, like, yeah, we're yeah, we're yeah. knowledgeable hey, enough to, to yeah. give you the resources to go out yeah. and do your sure. own. Sure. If you're gonna be in line look. for the scuttlebutt. You want to be next to Nick, yeah. Will, and Vic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. yeah. And if you're a Ukrainian expert and want to talk and get on this podcast, we are easily accessible. And Seriously. So like, hit us up. We have we have our email address. Um, Scuttlebot at mca-marines.org. So, yeah, so hit us up, and, and we would love to have you on and, and, and talk more intimately about these issues. So, yeah. all right, and this is going up this afternoon, so we're going to try and be as live as possible. This is not a regular Monday episode. Right. Um, just because it's timely and it could be. I mean, this is some, like you said, this could be. I forget what the term is when, when things happen in history that change, like turning points, yeah, yeah, watershed, yeah, yeah. Watershed, yeah. watershed, watershed moment. moment. Yeah, man, this is this is insane. Yeah. So. So everyone, stay safe. If you're uh, prayer for Ukrainians. Oh, dude, and if you're in uniform, man, like keep your head up. And just be ready, man. Stay frosty. And I think there's a, 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 a like grassroots protest going on at the Russian embassy in D.C. So if you're local, head over there and throw some. Actually, no, don't start an international incident. Well, don't um, throw. Oh, I think <laughs> I if you're gonna throw, throw shade. Yeah, Didn't throw some shade. In London, they were <laughs> protesting, weren't they? Like, I think it might just yeah. be. Or happy just have your voice heard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get so. out there. Um, let people know what you think about stuff. So, all right. Well, that'll do it for us. Uh, I guess hey, yes, yeah. <laughs> keep up on it. Scuttlebutt is a production of the Marine Corps Association. I am Nick Wilson. That is Major Vic Rubel, U.S. Marine Corps retired. We have also heard the voices of or contributions from William Truding or Nancy Lichman, editors of Gazette and Leatherneck magazines, respectively. Opinions expressed in Scuttlebutt are just that, opinions, and do not represent any official stance of the MCA.